Wow, that sounds really accomplished, doesn't it? I love my own bio. But uh, anyway, I will try to do my best to substitute for the, uh, whoever is on The Apprentices, because I'm not, obviously. I do have my own web TV show on YouTube. Uh, you can feel free to look at this. So I'm Gerhard Leonhard. I live in Switzerland. Uh, I spent seven ye 17 years in the US as a musician and producer and then as an internet entrepreneur. And I went through the whole transformation of digital music from Napster to uh, Spotify. In fact, uh, Spotify is based on my first book called The Future of Music. And I remember the day that we had a meeting with David Bowie to write the book, uh, when he was still there, rest in peace. And uh, he said, music will be like water. And then we said, that's good, yeah, music like water. So we wrote the book on, on this theme, and now we have Spotify. So that's how it goes sometimes. So here's my job, really, in a, in a nutshell. Uh, it's really quite simple. I, I don't predict the future. Uh, there are some people who can do that, Alvin Toffler and others. Right? I observe the future. And this is a really important skill for my clients, too. Because now the future is basically here. I mean, 10 years ago, we sat down, we talked about the paperless office and the cloud and, you know, uh, artificial intelligence been 30 years, you know, the self-driving car, 30 years, electric car, didn't happen, right? But now everything is happening at the same time now. It feels like we're, we're like in this warp drive of change, right? So basically a lot of people these days I speak to, they're saying, oh my God, the future. Right? There's robots, unemployment, automation, Donald Trump, right? the Brexit, right? the Italians. Right? Uh, Whatever, right? So the future is bad. And then when you, when you go to see a movie, the future is also bad, right? It's Ex Machina, and it's a Terminator, and you know, there's her, and all these movies. So people are worried about the future, and then they look at things like these graphs, right? Uh, they make us feel like everything is going south, right? So more CO2, less fresh water, more dead zones and dead species. All true. And then we have those things, you know, these are modern worries. Demographic, we're all getting older, seriously older, right? The whole workforce is getting older. Automation will take our job. I mean, that, that is not our job, but some jobs, right? That is a fact. Inequality has, some argue, increased. Right? Doesn't look like it has not. But regardless of this, you know, if we're looking at those kind of things, you know, all the things that are happening in terms of like cybersecurity, for example, right? People are saying, God, cybersecurity. Huge topic exploding. I think the future is awesome. I think it's better than we think because if you look at all the amazing things that have happened the last 10 years, we used to pay 20 quid for a CD. Now we have Spotify for 10 quid, 20 million songs. We send free messages on WhatsApp. Poverty has declined almost 70% in some countries. We're just ab about to reinvent energy, for example, to renewable energy. So here's a list of things that are happening without being sort of naive about the problems, which I'll talk about, right? But the future is not as dystopian as it looks. Right? Uh, I think this is primarily because it's all happening at the same time, and right? we feel a little bit overwhelmed, especially when you're not 20. You know? So this is all the things happening in the next 20 years. Right? We're going to be able to solve the food problem by vertical farming, for example by what's called smart farming. We're going to be able to stop or, re or reverse global warming. Until that happens, we'll have to put up with it. Right? So there's no doubt with it, the next 20 years, as far as global warming is concerned, will be lots of dire catast catastrophes and those kind of things, right? But we can then solve it. Uh, we can prevent diseases by genetic engineering. We can desalinate water. We're going to have abundant solar energy. That's all technology. There's only one thing that we have to do, we have to actually agree on what we want. And we have to use technology to the positive effect. Because, you know, what we have now is essentially technology is uh, coming to the place where we have several technologies that are as powerful as nuclear weapons. Okay? Artificial intelligence, genetic engineering, geoengineering. Right? We can completely change the world with that to the good or not so good, right? This is really a question of how we use it, right? So, I live in Switzerland, right? And I think I would bring some Swiss cars with me. As an example of what is happening in terms of innovation, right? Richard Branson has invested in this company that is growing meat in the lab. Right? It's not artificial, it's actually meat cells from animals, but it's not animals. Uh, and it's called clean meat. Right? 
and currently it's about $2,000 a pound. I tasted it the other day, tasted very good. Actually, you know, it's actual meat, you know, it's basically not grown on the, on the animal, but in the lab, you know, they call it from lab to fork. <laughs> kind of funny. But. So, you know, for $2,000 a pound, it's not very feasible. But Branson and Bill Gates have invested. They do all this weird stuff, right? Uh, in five years, the price will be just like regular meat. In 10 years, one-tenth. That is an interesting angle, because, you know, you wouldn't think that this is a reality. But basically, I think what we see happening now, uh, quite simply put, you know, we are in the future that's already here, right? It's just unevenly distributed. William Gibson, science fiction author. If you want to define the future of your business, you have to look where it already is. And you can see that. Basically, the five to seven year time frame you can expect, you can see the future there pretty clearly. So I'll, I'll show you some of those ideas and then we can uh, discuss it later if we have time. Probably not, we'll try. This curve is the most important, right? The exponential curve. You heard about Moore's law, Metcalfe's law. That's an old hat, right? But here's a key point. Yeah? We're at the takeoff point of this curve. We're actually at the point to where it actually starts to matter, which is four, right? Four, eight, 16, 32. So if Moore's law continues, which it seems like it does for almost everything, then in just five years we'll be at, at 256. I mean, it's just mind-boggling speed. 30 times up the scale, 1 billion. The kids of my kids will never know how to drive a car. They won't know what a CD looks like. They will not know what it means to be offline, which is a strange thing. So there's things are going to happen, like this whole list of things, I'm sure you're aware of it, right? will change our lives, our businesses, and I think it's 90% positive if we can agree on what exactly we're going to do here. I mean, since you guys are doing a lot of marketing discussions, advertising the future of media, you know, it will be very important to keep those things in a positive framework. Right? I mean, we've seen plenty of examples how it can go wrong, and so all of those things are happening now at the same time, and this is really quite clear. We're going to change more in the next 20 years than the previous 300 years. 300 years ago, industrial society. Before that, of course, uh, the invention of the printing press. Then television, the internet. Yeah, that was all big stuff. But now, technology is actually changing us. Right? On the mobile phone, that's kind of changing our behavior. But to go onto our heads with virtual reality, that is changing how we see the world, right? Then going inside of us by connecting us directly to the internet. That, that's not a joke, you know, this is actually looked at, right? Elon Musk, the neural relays. And our society has changed vastly because of technology. Most of it good, but some not so good, like this idea of saying, you know, you're going to find everything you need inside of the screen, right? Well, it's quite obvious that, you know, you, you will not find happiness in the screen. <laughs> you find something there, but it's not the same, because that's about engagement with people. Right? So this is a really important trend, you know, we have to say, well, all the changes that have already happened, you know, e-commerce, books, the, uh, the mobile phone companies, e-commerce, all these things, now the car is transportation on top of this wave. Right? On the beach, we have the newcomers, right? Education, banking, insurance, medical, the same transition we saw in the music business will happen there. It just takes a little bit longer. So consider yourself lucky you're on top of this wave now going along and really what drives the wave is three, three points. First, I've said this for about 15 years, <laughs> data is the new oil. I mean, data is the force of society. And this is what we're struggling with today because these data companies, you know, the top 20, which I'll show you shortly, they run the world. And we use data, of course, we've, we've been discussing data all day long, right, to better achieve our goals. Uh, in fact, now in 2016, the data economy was worth roughly $7.8 trillion, more than the entire oil and gas and nuclear energy of the world. So who really has the power today is not the oil and gas companies or the military, or it, it, it's the data companies. Uh, in fact, sometimes they're the same, of course, but... Uh, the next thing, AI is the new electricity, artificial intelligence. If you have all the data, there's nothing you can do without AI. Because, you know, think about that. If you're getting 100 million data feeds from social media about a product, 
It's all happening in real time. Without having those tools, you're not going to get it. Yeah? It's just not humanly possible. Right? So to process the data, we need intelligent machines. And don't be mistaken about this. This has nothing to do with human intelligence. Okay? Human intelligence is not machine intelligence. It's not processing. You know? like when, you, when you think of something and you make a decision, you don't go to the back of your brain and say, let me retrieve this file you know, and think about that. It's much more, you know, human intelligence is like 50 things at the same time. So this is really just machine intelligence. The last one, of course, is the Internet of Things. Connected cars, connected houses, smart watches, like all of those things coming together. McKinsey says roughly a, a shift of $65 trillion economy, uh, what people refer to as smart everything. Uh, very powerful stuff, but of course, and we have to say, well, it could be heaven or it could be hell, right? I mean, clearly, if your car is connected, your home is connected, your money is digital, you're using the blockchain for transactions, your health records are online, which they have to be sooner or later, right? It could be heaven because things may be cheaper. Like, you know, your medical coverage could be cheaper if you're sharing. Right? But then all the people could get into your stuff like they do now on Facebook, right? As has been discussed again this morning, right? That is a big question. So who's in charge and who's controlling this? And, you know, I, I like to say jokingly, science fiction is becoming science fact. I mean, voice control has been around for at least 30 years kind of work like Dragon software and those kind of things, you can speak to it and, you know, but today we're getting to the point where you can say, well, in, in just a little bit, maybe a year or two, it's 100%. If you speak, you know, disciplined, you know, not throwing in any other languages or, like my own name, you know, cannot be used on Siri because Siri says, I'm a nerd, not gerd, right? <laughs> or a, a turd or whatever, you know, what, <laughs> yeah. It's like, you see all the variations I tried on Siri, didn't work, right? But, but now, you know, we're going to connect to the cloud by speaking to the machine like a friend. Literally. That will be extremely confusing and extremely powerful. So in the future, when I go to buy my trip to Cancun, you know, I'm not going to go to the search engine. I'm just going to say, hey, go into Cancun, figure it out. Because right? the machine knows everything about me, my schedule, my money, my, my credit card. That's already working. Right? Alexa, right? that's what Amazon wants to do. And Google is switching entirely to AI, to voice-controlled AI. So Google is essentially making a copy of your data, and then you can access it with voice control. Great if you're, for example, 85 years old, you want to watch TV today on the internet, that, that'll be a tough one, right? In just a few years, you sit down on your couch and say, show me Colombo or Kojak or, you know, that old stuff, right? Uh, and, and you can just pick and it will just play in whatever language. I mean, that's pretty amazing stuff for the future. And then we see a machine learning machines that are capable of looking at data and making sense out of it. Like, you, you, can, f you can feed entire air traffic data in there, and then it will tell you a better way of doing it. The city of Los Angeles just put all the traffic lights online, and they're saving 10% by the machine telling them how to switch the lights. It's impossible for humans. Things like this, right? And we never thought that a robot could actually do this. It's an 850-kilogram robot, right? You can now act like a human. Right? I mean, look at this stuff. I mean, it's like... Think of a backflip, right, of a, of a machine like this coming up, right? Mind-boggling. I mean, it's, you never thought that it's actually possible for a machine to do that, right? Uh, and traffic control, like, right? for example, intersections are going to be controlled by machines so that in a self-driving car, you'd never stop. I mean, you're just rushing through the intersection because the machine has figured out that the car in two hours will be exactly at this point, right? which means you can't drive anymore. Right? I think you figured that out, right? If you're a lonely human here, you're in deep trouble. <laughs> so that's not good for Germans, you know, they love their cars, but, yeah. But let's look at exponential in a different way. I mean, the, you've seen this before, but it's really powerful stuff. I mean, the amount of information, right? data is the new oil. 
Could be heaven, could be hell. I think primarily it's a good thing because all the things we can do with this. Look at the stuff in terms of the value for computer equipment, the hard drive capacity essentially going through the roof. The adoption curves, you know, this is all taken from Mary Meeker's latest deck. You may have seen Mary Meeker's. Tyna Perkins just came out a couple of days ago. 300 pages you should download. Uh, just look for Mary Meeker with two E's. And adoption of new things, right? I mean, Lexa, for example, very powerful. So this is exponential world. And one thing we have to realize here is that if you're one of those guys here, a silo, right? a bank, a car company, a record label, that's the worst case, right? Uh, a publisher, right? If, if you're in one of those silos, the cloud is going to eat you. Okay. And this is what's happening everywhere. We used to say jokingly, Mark Andreessen, right? Software is eating the world. Good for Acquire, I guess, right? <laughs> but, you know, think about this. Now it's platforms are eating the silos. Right? Amazon is eating retail. Right? And, of course, you know, that's a great example. What is happening here is that, you know, very, very powerful trend. Uh, look at those companies here, also from Mary Meeker, right? I mean, look at this, right? Going from this measly sum of roughly 1,400 1, billion, that's 14 trillion, I guess, going up three times in a very short time frame. Companies that didn't even exist. And who are they? Americans and Chinese. Many people from the UK and from Europe are inside of those companies, of course, right? But this economy is run by American companies and Chinese companies. And it's very interesting to see that, you know, this is a huge, I mean, look at this momentum. You couldn't invest your money in any better than here if you're looking for investment, right? I mean, it's mind-boggling change, right? Amazon is going to be a bank. I don't know if you, if you realize this, right? But every Amazon Prime customer will get a free bank account. Free banking, no transaction fees, no peer-to-peer -peer sharing fees, zero. Right? First in the U.S., rolling out now. Right? I mean, talk about, you know, platforms eating silos. <laughs> so if you're Lloyds Bank or, I mean, Lloyds is trying really hard, I think they'll, they'll get there, right? I mean, this is 100 million people. And then we have this tiny thing called quantum computing, which is computers in a 3D environment filled with gas, so not using transistors or CPUs, right? Primitively put, right? <laughs> million times the computing power has already launched at CES this year in Las Vegas. million times the power. That is essentially what we need to run all of those processes, like programmatic advertising, right? all the things that we're already doing these days. Essentially building an artificial brain. That's only five, seven, maybe ten years away from Main Street. So this machine that's running my presentation in ten years will have a million times computing power, just like my mobile phone today has the capacity of the machine that brought the Americans to the moon. So that's all really interesting stuff, and then we get to this. You heard about this before, right? Essentially, machines will eventually surpass us in intelligence. Well, intelligence meaning, of course, processing, right? N not everything else. Well, I'll mention that shortly. <laughs> so we shouldn't be uh, concerned too much about that part of it. But what happens at this point is called the singularity, the point of infinite technological power. I think that's pretty amazing stuff, but we have to think about this, you know, very soon, that's roughly 10 years away. The question is no longer if we can do something, but why? I think that's already the question already. So in your business, the question is not if you can do something, because the answer is probably yes. Just a question of, of firepower, maybe money. Right? In 10 years, that stuff will be a standard. And then we have to say, well, why are we doing this? What is the value to the customer? Do we treat the customer like an algorithm? Do we set up a better mousetrap in marketing? Right? This whole concept of saying, you know, we're going to build a better place to catch the customer. That is good today because, you know, it's, it's hard to build that place, right? In 10 years, effortless. So when I speak to people about the future, it's very important to realize we're not talking about tomorrow. Right? We're talking about today that is reaching into tomorrow or backwards. The future is no longer about a time frame, it's a mindset. Right? And I would propose to you, if you want to be there in 10 years, you have to have a future mindset. 
and this is what it looks like. Right? It's exponential, combinatorial, open, right? This is about open software. We talk about this all day long today. Convergent, holistic. Holistic means you figure out a business model that works for others as well. Right? Talk about Uber, Airbnb, right? I love these guys, but does it consider the other part of the equation? Right? Interesting debate. You know, it's very successful, very disruptive, but is it actually building an ecosystem? I mean, open source is famous for building ecosystems, obviously, right? where it all comes together. So it's about the mindset. And now, if you're looking at this, that's happening all around us, substantial scientific advances in pretty much every sector of society, whether it's nanotechnology, neuroscience, genetic engineering. So to make sense out of that, we need a futuristic mindset. So if you cannot answer the question, what will you be in five years? You're in trouble, because the five years will be next year. This is crucial. So sit down at home and say, in five years I will be, and my company will be in five years like this. For example, I, in my company, we have four to six people working on future stuff. We used to write research reports and sell them for like 10,000 pounds, you know? And we realized it's useless because, you know, now the research report is Google. Right? You go to Google Trends and you ask Google Trends. Or you can go to IBM Watson if you have access. And you say, what is the future of the Swiss franc? IBM Watson will tell you. That's my job in there. Right? So now we're moving on to creating more human values, more understanding, which machines can't do. I'll give an example that's very important here for our work. Machines can look at numbers, infinitely powerful numbers. But if you ask a machine to look something that's in between the numbers, like something you're trying to say but haven't, or something you're trying to hide but the other person knows even though it hasn't been said, right? or something that is accidental, the machine wouldn't understand what in the world you're talking about. Right? It's either a zero or it's a one. I mean, it's not like the computer can say, well, he changed his mind, or there was an accident, or maybe he lied a little bit like customers do, right? We do. So in this world, we're moving into the world, what I call the mega shifts in my book, which is uh, technology versus humanity. You know where to click if you want one. Um, I think some of you already have one, but... So the mega shifts here are very important. This is our script for the next 10 years. And you wouldn't believe how many companies I talk to that talk about digital transformation, right? Like the, the miracle stick is the transformation, right? Well, it's a bit more than that because it's a moving target. You know, we basically have all of those things, the virtualization, right? things moving into cyberspace from reality, right? cognification, which is thinking machines, right? all basically covering each other. There's a website I run called megashifts.com, but you should zero, zero in on this. I'll give you some examples so you can visualize what it looks like. For example, here's uh, the North Face. They use IBM Watson for cognitive e-commerce. So here, if you, you go to the website, you say, I'm going to go hiking in Yosemite next week, then you don't have to poke around for the right jacket because Watson will look at the temperature, the predictions, the weather record of the previous year, how good you are at hiking, how big you are, what your body weight index is, and whatever, right? and will right, find one jacket for you instantly. I mean, it's a simple example for, I mean, with a jacket, it's pretty trivial, you know, when it's about other things, probably more complicated. Disney is using this connected device in the, in the theme parks to make a complete match with who you are. And of course, there's tracking involved, right? I'm not so sure that's such a good idea, but Spotify is doing a great job with artificial intelligence, for example, making playlists. The most powerful feature on Spotify isn't the music. It's everything around the music, the social connectivity, the playlists, right? very powerful. As a musician, I made 20 records with different names, so don't look for them here. But they are on Spotify. And the other day, Spotify made a playlist for me saying, these are 50 songs that we know that you would like, and 10 of them were for me. Right? <laughs> and Spotify couldn't have known. Right? This is how smart the system goes. Right? So this bank, German bank N26, they're using all the mega shifts to basically wipe out. They just passed a million user mark yesterday. And completely digital native millennial bank using this. And this is what they all do. 
we talked about this earlier as well, the experience, right? Forget commodities, goods, even services, and we're moving towards experiences. And, and this is primarily because the human brain is wired for experiences. What is most important to humans is not facts. It's not calculation, it's not algorithms. It's relationships and experiences. I think this has been known for a long time, but now you know, companies that make experiences, such as Airbnb, they actually have a product called experiences, right? They're vastly successful. And so in this world, we're now moving into, you know, we jokingly call this a smart converter. All you have to do is stick in the old business, out comes the smart business, come out, and boom, you're in business, right? Kevin Kelly uh, jokingly says that the next 10,000 business ideas, you take an old business, you put AI in front of it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's funny when you go check the news, you know, every day there's news saying, oh, you know, Shell Oil is using AI to, like, you know, clean up the garbage or whatever, right? Uh, good luck for that. But uh, this is what's happening, right? The mega shifts, and I think it's important that we don't forget this. Ultimately, it's not, we're not selling the customers some, some algorithms, you know, some logical thing, right? We're selling something that they would need for some other reason, a human reason. And so when we have this, you know, we're already living in this world where data is coming together with machines, virtualizing things, and then we end up here, you know, in this place where we have a, a sort of a brain, right? I mean, if you're a marketer, you love this idea, right? I'm not talking about Skynet here, you know, I'm just... Right? This is really what's happening. Right? These, all of these platforms, whether it's Amazon, Google, Facebook, Baidu, Alibaba, they're making digital copies of what we are. Right? I mean, that's, that's the idea. That can be terrible, it can be bad, it can be really good, but you know, the bottom line really is if we have to think about this in the future, you know, basically we're heading towards this. And again, without any judgment, some of that could be absolutely amazing. Like, we could save millions of lives if we connected medical care in the cloud. DNA research. Right? But we have to think about you know, the, uh, this concept, you know, of what we can do with technology. You've seen the movie Ex Machina, right? I think customers and consumers love the convenience of, not this, but the previous one. <laughs> but they're kind of worried about this technological domination, you know, the abuse, like, you know, you've seen, of course, similar scenes in Black Mirror, for example, right? Which, which resonates with people a lot because it brings us up. So the thing about this is, this is not per se bad, it's just when you do it too much, it's bad. Right? When, you, when you overdo it, when you, don't, when you lose your borders. Right? So this is very important, I think, for all of us. I call this hell then, yeah? heaven and hell. Right? As we're going into the future, we can say, well, it could be great if we use it correctly. It could generate lots of value. But if we overdo it, you know, we build this perfect mouse trap. You know? I think Facebook really make, makes the best example for this. Right? I'll tell you more about Facebook in a second. But it's like Facebook wasn't hacked. Right? Mark isn't a criminal. Right? It wasn't intentional, but still, you know, we have a problem. Right? It's very hard to figure out, you know, it's like you can point your finger in all different directions. Right? But, you know, when you're looking at this, basically saying, okay, this is really what it comes down to, right? Technology is exponential, but we are not. You are not going, I mean, maybe in a hundred years we can be exponential by, you know, changing our brain or changing our body. Right now we have to sleep, we need food, we have downtime, we're just not exponential. We're not efficient, we're not fast. There was a joke the other day, somebody said, you know, technology makes everything faster and humans make everything slower. That's kind of what it is. And, and so I think we have to live with this also when we do our work. We can't expect people to be exponential like a computer because it, it just won't happen. Right? And decisions aren't made on algorithms. And then we have, you know, we're already living in a world where we can safely say that uh, technology is the new religion. Right? I mean, that's, we admire it. Right? I mean, I'm not religious, so, we have to think about this, you know, how far are we going to go? Because, you know, basically mobile devices are already our external brain. And Marshall McLuhan already said in the 70s, right, 
that every extension that we have also amputates a piece. So we go further and then we lose other things that we used to have. Maybe that's not a big deal when it's about maps. But when it's about dating, family planning, probation, When it's about this, you know, virtual reality, I think it's extremely interesting in a business-to-business -business context. Could possibly make us superhuman in a, in a way, right? Very powerful, but we have to be careful that we don't end up, you know, falling off the stack here when, when we don't have it. I mean, I, I don't know if you notice the feeling sometimes when you're out without a mobile phone, if that ever happens, right? Off a bit, but, you know, you feel like, you know, you, 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 you can't defend yourself. You're completely, like, unplugged, right? And after a while, you get used to it. But imagine you live in a world where you, you're wearing a virtual reality helmet for work, like a doctor or a lawyer, right? And then you take it off, you feel like, oh my God, it's so boring. Right? Well, it could be a potential issue, you know, with artificial intelligence giving us advice all day long. Right? Could we forget how we do it like sort of a mental Viagra, you know, we can't do it without it kind of thing? Right? The kids grow up like this. I mean, we can laugh about this today because it's not a big deal, you know, but, but think about that in the future, you know. Maybe these kids will not learn how to build a sandcastle because a sandcastle is so boring compared to the iPad, you know. Or maybe they stop wanting to know how to, how to write because they can just speak. Right? You'd be surprised as the first people saying that our kids shouldn't learn how to write, you know, handwrite. I'm not joking here, right? Because we can just talk. Right? So... Kind of an odd topic, right? But clearly what we have here, we have this, right? This mix of the two. We have to make sure that in our work we focus on this. Right? What Steve Jobs called the magic. This is about ethics. We decide what is the right thing to do. As a bottom line, Supreme Court Judge Potter Stewart said, ethics is known the difference between what you have a right or the power to do and what is the right thing to do. Now, that is the perfect description for a Facebook problem. Right? They have enormous power, right? the biggest country in the world. Now, they're going to do the right thing. Is the GDPR the right thing? I have no idea. I think that sounds massively complicated, obviously. <laughs> right? But, I mean, how are we going to balance those? Things? I think, you know, for our work, how you position yourself between those two, that is, will define your success. Will people look at you as a brand, as a person, as reliable, as trustworthy? Right? Or they look at you as a giant algorithm? Algorithms technology is a commodity. I mean, look at the mobile phone companies, right? You switch instantly from, you know, whatever is two cents cheaper. Right? No brand loyalty. So, magic technology, Steve Jobs talked about this a lot. I'll show this example from Google Duplex. You, you've seen Google Duplex probably at Google I.O. or so. You know, it's a machine that makes phone calls for people. It's a virtual digital assistant that can go and call anyone to get anything done, you know, like getting a dentist appointment or, you know, so here's a short demo. You may have seen this already. Client, um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. That, that's mm -hmm. a good I have sort of a uh, riffing off of this topic, you know, a different variation. This is not officially from Google, so if anybody is here from Google, I apologize, but this is another take on, on the same question. Hello? Hi, can I talk to Diane, please? Speaking. Hi, Diane. I'm calling on behalf of John to schedule an appointment. Calling, right? For what? The appointment for you to come pick up your belongings from John's apartment. <laughs> Excuse me? John would like you to remove your belongings from his apartment. What are you talking about? I'm very sorry, but John has decided to end your relationship. Yeah, so that's interesting, you know. I, I think there's a lot of potential for toxic relationships here. Yeah? <laughs> uh, and this is the problem with technology, right? I, love, I think I love this idea, you know, so it's hard to say whether it's good or bad, but there's certainly lots of abuse here. Right? I mean, you can imagine where that would go, you know, if you, 
you make phone calls of people perhaps. So this is going to reboot marketing, this whole idea, right? We're going to go inside of people's brains and look around for information, like Amazon Echo, Alexa. We're going to make digital copies of people. There's actually an app for this called Replica. Don't try it, please. But that's what they do so that when you die, your family can keep talking to you. This is the purpose of the app, right? Very interesting stuff. And of course, you know, how do you reach people without overreaching, without addiction? That is the primary question for any brand. And the answer is a relationship. Right? When you have a relationship, you don't just say, you know what, I really love you because you're so efficient. Right? <laughs> That's stupid. There's like a thousand reasons why you would love somebody. Right? It's not just efficiency or, you know, all that stuff, right? It's, I mean, looking at this, you know, we're going to have to figure out how these companies keep their license to operate. Right? This is an important question. My view, that will be very hard for Facebook to do. Other ones will do better. I think Google is making a great effort here, but, you know, now <laughs> Mark is talking about all these things, you know, to save himself from falling into the deep hole here in Europe. I deleted Facebook three weeks ago. I was maybe the first 10,000 ever on Facebook. It was a big decision, it took three years. But I decided not to advertise on Facebook anymore, not to use it. It's essentially an AI, right? Facebook is an AI, a data mining AI. Right? Can we live without it? That's hard, right? It's kind of like, okay, <laughs> very difficult question. But maybe it's like this, you know, maybe it's a burning platform, I don't know. But I think what is really happening here is that we have to look at the future and say it's no longer about just stupid disruption. You know, disrupt this, you know, move hard and break things, right? Move fast and break things, mm -hmm. the Facebook motto. It's about construction now, it's about building things. Building things that actually work. And keep that in mind when you're, when you're working on projects. I mean, you're not looking just for this, the disruption effect, you know, that's kind of over. We have to look a little bit further. Like data mining you now, which is the most common way of advertising, in my view, has hit the peak. Right. Some of that will always work because of various circumstances, but really what we're talking about now in the future is what I call data mining with a Y. Right. Of course, it's always going to be a little bit of both. You know. That's just the reality of commercial relationships. Right. But if, if you put your sides in data mining, I think you'll fare well because it creates relationships. It's possible to have this idea of saying, well, you know, it's, uh, as I like to say, you now data is great, but dataism, uh, which is adoring data, you know, loving data more than people, is not. It can be successful for a little while because it obviously has lots of output, right? But I, I love this saying from this guy, also Supreme Court judge, if you torture data long enough, it will confess to anything. <laughs> so that's not to say that data is useless. It's not. It's very useful. But let's not believe everything that we hear from an algorithm. Right? I mean, there's a few things that we also know that are important. You know? So also to remember that it's not you know, what I call artificial smartness, not artificial intelligence. That's completely unlike human intelligence. Most machines that we have today that are so-called artificial intelligence, they're as dumb as a toaster, okay? And they will get smarter, right? and they will do things. But, you know, we have all of these intelligences, social, emotional, kinesthetic, musical, all of those things, right? I think we have to focus on the low-hanging fruit, what are called intelligent assistants, IA. That's basically fancy software. That's what we're doing here, right? We're looking at intelligent software. We're not looking at human software or human thinking. That's far away. We're at least 50 years away from that. I wouldn't contest that in 50 years we can have a machine that can be like a human. But it's not going to be in the Elon Musk time frame, I don't think. You know. I mean, look at this example, right? This artificial hand. If you, if you should have an accident and lose your hand, you can buy a prosthesis. The million euro per thesis to replace your hand, right? million euros, is 1%, has 1% capacity of the human hand for a million euros. That's where we are today. Right? You have a prosthesis, you can do stuff like pick up a glass. Right? 
it's 1% even at the very, very peak. Moravec says, famous scientist, whatever is simple for human is very hard for a computer and vice versa. Let's keep that in mind when we think about software and how we deal with customers and clients because you know, we're moving in, into this world now in a rapid way. Uh, that is going to really push us. You know, uh, Picasso said, and Kevin Kelly then followed on this, computers are for answers, people are for questions. And this is why I believe we will not become useless in the future. As people have argued, right? We will lose a lot of jobs that are routine jobs because computers will learn them. Can we rise above that? We can. What does it take? Well, a lot of things, right? But it takes a little bit of rethinking, you know. Machines don't do relationships. And they shouldn't. Let the machines do the monkey work, right? The heavy lifting, the bookkeeping, the accounting, the, the filing, the, the research, the fact-finding, all of those things. And don't think of artificial intelligence as a mousetrap, right? I mean, I can't tell you how many people I talk to that are saying, you know, now that we have AI, we can fire lots of people, make more money and get our customers more, you know, they can't leave. Very bad idea. This is really what our customers want. They want experiences. They want transformations. They want what's called PERMA in psychology. Positivity, engagement, relationships, meaning, you know, human stuff. Pretty simple. So let's not forget about this because culture is also the, the biggest success factor when I meet companies that are transforming. Culture is a success factor, whether you can look beyond the immediate today. Right? It's all about culture. Why are Americans leading 95% of data commerce in the world? Because the culture says we go forward no matter what. Right? Invent everything. In Switzerland, we perfect everything. We don't want to invent. We go to America to do that. Yeah. So um, I'll wrap up now because time is up. But you know, for your future in terms of jobs, it's very important to realize that the end of routine is coming. Right? That's 10 years away until a computer learns pretty much every routine. But that's not the end of human work. It's just we have to get busy moving above the routine. If you're a bookkeeper, you will not have a job on the lowest level. If you work in a call center, you will definitely not have a job. That's 17 million people. So if you look at the positive part, I think the flip side of this, you know, all of these things that we consider human, right, they're still very much unattainable for machines. That's how we build relationships, trust, client understanding. Right? That's the jobs for our kids of the future. So I'll do the quick summary, then I'm off, because I've got to go to Lisbon tonight. But uh, we will distribute the slides later, because I know there were quite a few, right? uh, so you can review them. So the future is better than we think. Let's change our, our frame of mind, and let's build things that are magic, not toxic. Right? Don't build toxic stuff, or even manic stuff, because right? it doesn't really have a future. Now, it, it works for a while, but it doesn't work for very long. The ticket really is exponential, combinatorial, open, converged. Right? I mean, this is, of course, when we talk about software, that to me is the key. Data is in your oil, man and machine are overlapping, so yeah, this is really for us. We have to figure out how we're going to lead in what I call the ethics of technology. What is good technology and what is not? What is good for the client and what is not? You know, if you're an airline, you're primarily concerned about what is good for you using technology. I mean, I don't know if you observed this, a great example, right? Airlines have been using technology to actually reduce the power of the customer. <laughs> right? and, and that is really changing now, so think about that in a different way. Yeah. Smart machines are not humans. We shouldn't treat them, we shouldn't give them rights, we shouldn't elevate them, we shouldn't think about their ethics, they are just machines. And we should use them as such, and then I think we, we can get to a good place, right? Uh, the end of routine is not the end of work. If you have kids, don't let them learn any routine. The more our kids work like robots, the less work they're going to have. So make them into humans rather than just that. Uh, I just published a movie about artificial intelligence. It's a short one with a complicated URL. We need to talk about AI.com. It's actually on YouTube, so it's just a shortcut uh, if you want to watch this. And of course, my book is 
is here. So thanks very much for listening. I'll close with a statement by David Bowie, one of my musical mentors, who said in the 80s, eh, the future belongs to those that can hear it coming. And I'm convinced if you can hear it coming, you'll be there in the future because that's inevitable. Thanks for listening.